destructive and so punitive. Uh, and if you have, to get back to your question, if you had the political changes in 2016, uh, I think that's a significant possibility. You know, I, don't, I never want to say things would be solved because politicians have a, an ability to mess up everything. Uh, but, but with Rubio or Paul, who I think would be the two front runners for the Republican nomination at this point in time, um, you, you would have some definite friends uh, from a philosophical basis in the White House. I mean, not that they would ever be making their decisions on the basis of, gee, what's good for the offshore world. They would be making decisions about what would be a better tax system for the U.S., what would be a better system in terms of respecting fiscal sovereignty, and that would wind up benefiting uh, Anguilla and the other IFCs. Not because that was the goal of U.S. policymakers, but the reforms that we would do would rebound to your advantage. And plus, with, with Rubio and, and Paul and people like that, they're much more instinctively hostile to international bureaucracies. I mean, Republicans like to bash the UN and stuff like that, uh, but th that carries over. They're, they're instinctively hostile to the IMF. They're instinctively hostile. It, uh, from the perspective of a lot of American taxpayers, we think these are just big money pits where we, the U.S. gives, you know, 20% to 25% of the budgets, and these bureaucracies just waste money. And so we can take advantage of that hostility uh, by pointing out that the OECD is the same way. Sorry, l long answer, but it was a good question. With our system, which is different than a parliamentary system, we're separation of powers. Uh, so like if, if somebody in a parliamentary system, if the, if the a uh, prime minister or head of government or whatever they're called in a parliamentary system wakes up one day and wants to do something, it's done. Uh, in the U.S. system with separation of powers, every politician is an independent agent. Uh, so if the president wants to do something, he has to somehow convince the House and Senate to do it. And even if your same party controls the House and Senate, Every Republican and every Democrat is elected independently. Yeah, of course, they, they like to get fundraisers from the president, and, and there are national parties that help contribute money. So, so there is pressure to go along uh, with your party, but it's not a, it's not a demand. Uh, even when Obama fully controlled the, the House, and, or the Democrats fully controlled the House and Senate, yeah, they got FATCA, yeah, they got Obamacare, yeah, they got the, uh, the so-called stimulus, um, but they couldn't get the climate change legislation. Uh, there were all sorts of things that they couldn't get when they fully controlled everything. Uh, now, Republicans only control the House. So, they just passed the Paul Ryan budget. He's another guy who may run for president in 2016, and he's been very friendly to, uh, to tax competition, so he would be another ally of Anguilla if he made it. Uh, well, Paul Ryan's budget has all this entitlement reform, uh, has all this tax reform, but it's never going to go anywhere in the Senate. And even if by some you know, lightning struck or something, uh, uh, even if it went through the Senate, Obama would never sign it. So what we're going to have in the U.S. for the next three years and nine months and whatever days is we're going to have stalemate, which actually normally isn't a bad thing. Our founding fathers in America set up separation of powers specifically because they wanted that. Madison in our Federalist Papers wrote about factionalism. Well, factionalism was basically gridlock. Gridlock's a good thing because if you assume that government is an enemy of freedom, you don't want government to do things. How do you stop government from doing things? You gridlock it. So gridlock, I think, historically has been a very beneficial thing for the American people. That's why government isn't nearly as big as it is in Europe, but it's heading in that direction. Uh, so four years of stalemate, we're not going to be able to do anything on FATCA right now. Maybe if Republicans win the Senate in 2014, maybe we can stick something into a bill uh, to put in this safe harbor rule so that if you have a tax treaty or a, a tax information exchange agreement, FACA doesn't apply, but that's still two years away. So, so I, don't wanna, I don't wanna remotely leave anybody with a sense uh, of optimism on FATCA. The only thing that can help us on FATCA right now is China, not the US. Kind of ironic. It reminds me of the fact that in 2000, I think it was 2009 at the OECD's Global Tax Forum in Mexico City, uh, we actually stopped something really bad from happening on this issue of tax avoidance because of China. So a nominally communist country was the one that had to save the supposedly capitalist world uh, from, uh, from doing it. But of course, then 
what's happened with this BEPS report and the G20, they figured out a way to go after tax avoidance anyhow. Um, well, you, I'm a policy wonk, not a tax lawyer or international treaty expert, um, so I would be reluctant to make any sweeping statements about what would be in your best interest, uh, though at the end of the day, I assume between being a UK territory and just the US being the 800 pound bully of the world economy, you're sort of, you're, you're going to have to just decide what's what's your least painful route forward, but I'm not competent to really answer that question. I will point out something very interesting, and this is what something that I've been bringing up when I'm up on the Hill meeting with, uh, with lawmakers and their staff. The Treasury Department is, this whole IGA process was created out of nothing. If you read the FATCA law, the FATCA law is all about the U.S. supposedly government supposedly directly interacting with foreign financial institutions. Nowhere in the FATCA law are there IGAs. So for the, for the Treasury Department to take a law that says red and for the Treasury Department to then say the law says green, that could be complicated down the road in terms of legal challenges. Not only that, but the Treasury Department is saying, these aren't tax treaties. These are just executive agreements. Well, of course, all the other countries that are doing these IGAs are treating them quite properly as treaties. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to convince senators, just out of the jealousy of protecting their own prerogatives, we're trying to get them upset that the Treasury Department is doing an end around and undermining their power. Because you know, maybe you might have a, a senator who doesn't really care about IGAs, doesn't really care about, they probably don't even know how to spell FATCA, even with the letters right in front of them. But they do want to protect their own turf. Uh, so we're trying to stir up a little bit of anxiety about that as maybe a way of throwing some sand in the gears of FATCA, because sort of tying in to the previous question, uh, the more we can delay this process, and maybe if we throw a lot of sand in the gears and start having hearings and start having complaints about, well, shouldn't the Senate have the right to approve these treaties because they are treaties? And oh, by the way, where in FATCA does it give Treasury the, the, the authority to do this in the first place? Am I optimistic? No, but does it give us an opportunity to cause trouble uh, and maybe at least stall the process out in hopes that in 2016 something happens? Yes. And, and that, that's a good answer because you know what happens with lobbyists in the U.S.? You give them a ten or $20,000 a month retainer, they send you a report once a month, and when they go talk to people on Capitol Hill, who are those people? Those are their former friends from when they were Capitol Hill staffers or former members or something like that. And, and I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but I would say in an overwhelming percentage of, uh, of situations, uh, people don't get their money's worth uh, in, in that environment. Uh, where lobbying can be successful is if you're like a big company and you want to get some special provision put in a law to, to sort of, so it doesn't apply to you, yeah, you go pay a lobbyist, you know, $500,000. Uh, they spread some campaign cash around, talk to some staffers who are going to wind up working for that lobbying group in five years anyhow. Uh, and then they put in that provision in the law. You, the company, save $5 million. It costs you $500,000. That's a good rate of return. But on big issues, I don't think the lobbying uh, pays off, which is unfortunate because a lot of things happen in Washington that affect you guys a lot, but it's just not practical. Uh, for you guys to fight it. I guess that frankly depends on just the quality of the banking institutions. Um, I mean, w w what do the local banks in the Caribbean, w what are their assets? Is it home mortgages? Is it small business loans? I mean, I, you know, you guys have a much better sense of that than I certainly will.